Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for having me. Uh, I'm thrilled to be uh, invited to this uh, forum. Um, today, I would like to discuss uh, the following topics. First of all, regulatory developments in ad tech. Uh, second, uh, competition developments in, in ad tech. You will see that there is a lot going on you may not be aware of, and this will have uh, fundamental um, implications. Then I'd like to discuss the tension between competition and privacy. Uh, and then finally, to give you some perspectives about what's going to happen in the years to come as far as regulation and competition is concerned. Let me give you a bit of background um, with regard to my implications in ad tech. So um, I'm working with publishers of all kinds, broadcasters, uh, news publishers, streaming companies, and so on and so forth. And four years ago, a couple of clients came to me and said, well, would you mind looking into ad tech? There are fishy things going on there. I say, all right, uh, but I know nothing about ad tech. And they said, well, it doesn't matter. We're willing to invest resources, and you, know, you can talk to our experts, and uh, with a couple of colleagues, we spent, um, you know, essentially six months to make sense, not on a full-time basis, but quite intense, intensely, to make sense of ad tech. Um, I've been involved in tech markets all my life, and this is by far the most complex and opaque. But the good thing is that after a, a lot of readings and tutorials, you have this eureka moment and suddenly understand how this works and then it gets uh, much more interesting. And um, when I started to make sense of ad tech, I agreed with my clients. There were some really fishy things going on from a competition law standpoint, which is my discipline. And since then, I've done a lot of work in the field, and I'd like to share some thoughts with you. So first of all, ad tech for a very long time has been un unregulated, right? I mean, um, some people make comparison with financial services because you have buyers, sellers, and an exchange in the middle, and financial services are heavily regulated, right? I mean, there are all sorts of rules about conflicts of interest. There are all sorts of things you can't do, and we've seen nothing of that in, in ad tech. And um, I think that's one of the reasons uh, some problems have occurred. One piece of legislation which has been recently adopted, it will come into force on the 1st of November, is the Digital Markets Act. It's not focused on ad tech, but it has some provisions covering ad tech. And essentially three of them, Yes, that's, that's the right slide. Three of them. One basically places some limit on combination of data unless consent is given. Uh, we can speak about consent for a long time. I'll say a few words about it in a minute or two. Um, but that is a first important rule. And then, as I mentioned, one of the issues with ad techs is very often the lack of transparency. In fact, my, when, when these clients came to me, their main request was, well, when we receive 50 cents, how much did the advertiser pay? We have no idea, right? So are we getting 50 cents to the dollar, 40 cents to the dollar, 60 cents to the dollar? We don't know. There is no way to know. Well, now you will know, actually, because two of these provisions in the DMA will actually uh, force gatekeepers uh, and we know who they are, to provide information to advertisers about, you know, what the sort of money that is paid to publishers for the inventory they buy, and vice versa. So that's going to be quite interesting, uh, this transparency. At the moment, there's no ad tech regulation in sight, uh, on top of uh, these regulatory obligations, but I think this is something that we may see in the future. 
No, what has kept me very busy uh, over the past four years are developments in the competition field. So after studying ad tech for a few months, um, I basically advised my clients to file an antitrust complaint. And initially we went to the European Commission, they looked at us saying, oh my goodness, this is complicated, we're very busy, thank you very much. Then we went to the French Competition Authority who had done a, a market study on ad tech and they loved the case. They said, we want to have it, please. We said, of course. And, you know, we basically explained why we think that some competition law violations were taking place. Essentially, Google controlling the totality of the ad tech stack and having market power essentially across the stack had engaged in what we call self-preferencing um, to the detriment of rivals and eventually publishers. Uh, the French Competition Authority agreed with us and fined Google 220 million euros, which is about three minutes of profits. But the important thing was that uh, we had a decision in our pocket showing in great detail, it's an extremely granular decision, you know, 60 pages long with numbers and everything, that what we thought was right, Google engaged in anti-competitive behavior. And to my view, it's not only anti-competitive behavior, it's fraud. I should say that I know Google is in the room, I have no personal issues with Google, there are a lot of very good and very smart people there, but my role is to keep them honest, and this is what I'm trying to do. And I, I also, I'm also trying to keep Apple and Facebook honest, but that's for another day. So we got the decision, and two things came to mind. First, good decision, but weak remedies. So my client, the European Publishing Council, which uh, has 28 of the largest publishers in Europe, decided to file a complaint to the European Commission earlier this year, and the Commission has opened proceedings against Google and we're busy helping them. Another client publisher in the UK um, asked me to file a complaint against Google to the UK CMA, which has decided to open proceedings as well. This is all ongoing, by the way, uh, Google is also being sued in the United States by a number of uh, state attorneys and the trial will take place in 2023. So there's a lot going on and I don't know what Google will do to extract himself from all these investigations. I think uh, uh, the situation looks quite dire. The second thing I was not entirely satisfied with, uh, with my French decision, besides the lack of remedies or insignificant remedies, was that I wanted my clients to be compensated. And so I started thinking about it, where shall we sue and who will pay for the cost? Well, we will sue uh, Google in the Netherlands uh, for damages across the EU, including Sweden, uh, and in the UK for damages occurred in the UK and uh, we are signing up publishers interested in the claim. We've got already pretty much all the big Nordic publishers, but if you're interested, send me an email, find me on the internet and send me an email. And this is fully funded. So there's a litigation funder paying for all the cost in return for a cut in the damages. These actions are becoming very popular. It's something new in Europe, but in the Netherlands and in the UK, you've got actions against not only Google, but also Apple, uh, Facebook, Amazon, and others. Um, and I think it's fair game to the extent you've been harmed by anti-competitive behavior, you know, as a business user or as an individual, it's only fair that you obtain compensation and by the way, this is something that is supported by the EU as there is a so-called damages directive which facilitates these sort of actions. Now, uh, let me turn to another topic uh, I'm interested in, uh, which is 
uh, the growing tension between competition and privacy. One of my clients, an American client who traveled across Europe um, um, last month said, there's one thing in common, you know, something I've heard from everyone, and he spoke to regulators and, you know, a government official, everybody hates the GDPR. I don't hate it. I think it's an interesting tool, but I think it's far from perfect, and I think it should be rewritten for multiple reasons. Um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon, but I think uh, uh, it has very significant limitations. When we started talking about the GDPR five years ago, it was all about constraining Facebook or constraining Google. Well, it, it's constraining everyone except these guys because they're better equipped to deal with the GDPR. In fact, the GDPR is annoying people like me, uh, a business owner with 12 or actually 14 employees, uh, uh, rather than giants who have all the resources in the world and can manipulate the rules, which is what they do. Privacy is a war instrument. It is what it is in the hands of powerful platforms. Today, you want to have access to data. Your, even your data, not possible. Privacy. You want to have, have access to, the tool, to this tool, not possible because of privacy. You want to launch this service, not possible because privacy. And it's not the regulator to say that. These are the gatekeepers to say that. Two examples. One example is the privacy sandbox, which is not a bad example. And I think in that respect, I must say that Google is doing better that's certainly Apple. Google basically decided to deprecate third-party cookies, right? It was to be done within two years. Good policy, giving times to the industry to adjust. I like that. But then some expressed concern that it could still further concentrate uh, ads into, you know, to the advantage of, of Google. They complained to the CMA. There was an investigation. Google gave commitments, which are being implemented under the supervision of the CMA. That's good. Hopefully that will work. I like commitments. I think it's a good way to do things. Apple's policy is absolutely awful. When they launched ATT, they did it, refusing to talk to the ecosystem. I represented IAB, France, in a complaint to the French Competition Authority, we said it's not possible. These guys are basically, you know, coming up with this prompt, which is not even in line with the GDPR, and they're doing this because they want to kneecap rivals before launching their advertising services. I was at the com French Competition Authority with the Apple lawyers in front of me and Apple executives. They said, we have no interest in advertising. We are a hardware company. Guess what? They're pushing advertising now. They want to become a major advertiser. The CMA wrote a long report, 1,000 pages, on mobile ecosystems. There is a full annex on ATT, which demonstrate that the prompt was built in such a way to steer users to say no, right? I'm not against privacy. I like people to be empowered. But the CMA says that it was done in such a way as to push users to say no. Because, of course, if you were asked without any additional explanation, why would you say yes? At the same time, the standards uh, Apple applies to itself are lower than those they apply to others. Guess what? People like me, are in, uh, like me are in charge now. Investigation in France, investigation in Germany, investigation in Poland. We'll see what happens. But I think it was totally unfair the way they, pre they, they proceeded. And the CMA made clear that they did not do any testing. Can you believe it? You're going to blow off, you know, billions and billions in ad without any testing of the prompt. Amazing. So where are we going? I think that the time of 
moves fast and breaks things is coming to an end. I think regulation is there. Let's see whether it's properly implemented, but I think that at least there will be some rules of the game. I don't know how Google will ex extricate itself from uh, the various investigations, but speaking to analysts, there is a belief that they will have to divest part of the stack and that will create new opportunities. We will see if that happens, but if it does, that's gonna be quite interesting. As far as uh, transparency is concerned, there will be more of it with the DMA. Competition and privacy will remain uh, a, a challenge, I, I have to say. Again, privacy is good, but it should not be a tool to impede rivals, to impede customers, to develop services, to get access to the data. I'm very concerned that with the DMA in place, privacy will be the excuse to do nothing. That's not the role of privacy. It's not, it was not created for that reason, right? So that's something very important. Uh, I should also say that another thing that uh, is facing uh, gatekeeper are damages, damages actions. Um, I think it's a new tool that will discipline them and I'm over time and I will uh, stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, where to start? Uh, first of all, an outsider who is actually welcome into our industry. A big applaud for that. <laughs> <laughs> this is often a small pond, um, so we're happy to have you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you were to be Google, how would you respond to yourself? <laughs> well, I've been there before. I mean, before creating my own firm, I worked in very large law firms and I defended Microsoft for 10 years. You remember Microsoft was in a position not very different from Google. I saw Microsoft turning a corner um, about, so the last case was in 2009, so it's 13 years ago, the general counsel who's now the president of Microsoft, Brad Smith, said, enough, enough trouble. We're destroying our reputation. We will be compliant. Since then, they are in a much better place. I'm not suggesting they're perfect, certainly not. They have flaws, they might still do a few, you know, bizarre things. But of all, the top five companies, the five platforms, they are in a much better place than the four others. So what I would say is that perhaps there should be a moment when you turn a corner, right? Okay, it might have a short impact, a short-term impact on profitability, but we cannot really say that Microsoft is close to bankruptcy, right? I mean, actually, if you look at the results, as a result of compliance, they've diversified their business tremendously. I mean, I think of the big five, perhaps with Amazon, this is the strongest player because of diversification. Um, and, and so, I think that's what I would suggest, but who am I to suggest anything to Google, right? I mean, uh, uh, if, if, if the CEO is looking at us, I don't think he does, but you know, uh, be compliant. That will help everyone. <laughs> <laughs> at least we're speaking his language right now, so yes, it, yes. it helps. Right? <laughs> um, but is Google to blame? Well, you know, I mean, my view of, of uh, uh, large uh, digital platforms um, is that, look, um, it's a competitive world, right? And they have shareholders and they have create expectations. So you've got very smart people whose mission is to maximize, to make the extra dollar. And I think business ethics has not been the strong point of these companies. You know, let, let's, you know they were proud to say, Facebook, Zuckerberg was proud to say, let's move fast and break things. So basically, we don't care about constraints, including legal constraints. So yes, you have a responsibility. You do. I mean, the law should apply to everyone. At the moment, they feel okay, because even a fine of a billion dollar is pocket money, right? And a fine of a billion dollar for a Swedish company would mean receivership, 
you know, not for these kind of companies. But I think they have a moral duty, and I think in the long run, in the long run, they will comply. There's a moment where pain is intolerable in terms of damage to reputation, legal actions, executive being deposed in court. It becomes uncomfortable, and I think this is coming. Apple, I'm not sure. Um, this company has a, a violent strategy of non-compliance, despise everyone else, and I'm, I'm not sure they're there, but eventually they will be as well. So I'm very optimistic, actually. I am optimistic, but we need regulation. We need regulators. We need judges, because this is the only way to create a level playing field where everybody's playing by the same rules. And this is what I'm trying to do. That's my business. I could stand here for the whole afternoon. Unfortunately, we have to move on. I know, thank and I have so to take a flight. Damien, All right, thank you so much. <laughs>